Good morning, friends. This is another edition of the Past Ball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com, by St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey, by Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. As always, a handful of stuff we're going to get into today is the, in the world, excuse me, of baseball sports and unify in America. I was going to get into some football points, and we still will get into it, but of course, uh, the breaking news you hear last night is the decision by the Cleveland Indians to no longer be known as the Indians. They will, at least at this point, be known as the American League baseball franchise that exists in Cleveland. And I think this was probably something that was expected to be a long time coming. I gotta be honest, I'm a little ambivalent about it. Uh, part of me says, you know, you don't wanna put anything out there that is, is hurtful or discriminatory or makes people feel uncomfortable. And, and I think the majority of us would agree. I mean, if there is something out there that is that offensive or bothersome to somebody, you'd prefer not to say it. You know, we don't go in our regular language as we're speaking with friends and intentionally say things that we know are hurtful, or especially when it comes to heritage, to race, to sexuality, all different things like that. We've, we've understood that there's just some things that some people may have said as a joke. Some people have used maybe as a mascot, maybe mocking something out or somebody out. That even if it's okay with a person that you could say in a joke form, that it's really not right to say as a generalization. And that's where I've come to grow with it. And I know a lot of other people have. We know about the Washington football team being no longer known uh, by their uh, nickname or mascot, and the same thing is going to happen with Cleveland. I will say this, though. One thing I want to throw in there, and I'm going to spend a couple points talking about this. You know, it's a reminder, anything that's on your mind in the world of baseball, sports, and unify in America, just comment, contact me through social media. Let me know what's on your mind. I look at it as something that you've seen for so long, and we live in this generation where we, we feel like we have progressed a lot. There's a lot of things that we always said and used the excuse, it's socially acceptable or wasn't a problem then. And we know about some of the more extreme situations when it comes to, comes to Jim Crow laws and segregation that you may say years ago it was okay when it really never was okay. And, and I'm okay with moving on from this. And I think the quicker we get to a resolution, I would prefer that the Cleveland Baseball Club be known as just that. And I, the reason, I actually have a couple reasons why I believe that they shouldn't go to a different nickname. Some people are down on the Washington football team as opposed to being the Washington whatever. You know, any, any throw any nickname you want in there and that'll be your, what you call the Redskins, the former team formerly known as the Redskins. But the same thing when it comes to Cleveland and this baseball team. I think number one, by calling it the Cleveland baseball team, shows another step that we've taken as a society to get hurtful and hateful nicknames and mascots out of sports. You know, to call it something else is just kind of pushing the fact that this team was known as the Indians for so long under a rug and just trying to move on and forget that it ever happened. And I think we do that a lot when it comes to racism. You know, we, we want to say, all right, all this stuff happened in the 1950s or before, but now that the majority of the people are better, it's easy to say, all right, we just, we'll just forget about it. Forget that it ever happened. Forget that blacks for a long time were treated as second-class citizens and not as equal as you and I if we just happen to have lighter color skin. So I think the same applies when it comes to Native Americans. Certainly many different Indian type of groups who have to deal with the fact that most of the Americans that live in this country, their ancestors basically took away their homes, their villages, and their way of life. So I think that's something that doesn't get spoken about as much. Uh, if you want to throw maybe a, a, a contradiction in there or something to go the other way, a rebuttal, you could say, well, how many people are actually impacted 
or offended or bothered by the fact that this Cleveland team since, what are we talking about, 1905, 1915, after they were no longer known as the Naps, became the Cleveland Indians. And you may say that there's not a lot of people that are offended by it. Now, I don't, I don't believe in offense because somebody could be offended. In other words, if I have nothing to do with a situation, if there's no way I can relate to a situation, if there's something that I have no connection to, I'm not going to say that I'm offended just because somebody else could be offended. Now, the fact that somebody else could be offended could be a legitimate reason to get rid of the nickname, certainly to get rid of Chief Wahoo which we kind of laughed about, it was a mascot, it was a joke, it was a caricature, but what it kind of was, was a generalization about all Native Americans, saying that they were this, you know, goofy, you know, character set up with this weird hair and the intention to look weird. Now that was offensive to people. Maybe not offensive to me, there's a lot of people in the general public that may just laugh about it. The Tomahawk Chop is the Atlanta Braves are playing a baseball game. We don't make the serious connection. It's not a matter of saying, well, screw Native Americans. But you understand that if that's where your heritage is from, that's where your ancestors came from, then that would probably bother you. You know, the, they, don't, they don't have, uh, you know, WAPs out there as a mascot for somebody. You know, they don't they don't have any 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 different type of stereotypes for religion or race out there. And we know that if if there was, if there was a logo or a nickname or a mascot that was offensive to larger groups of people, a stop would be put to it and a stop will be put to it immediately. So the last thing I want to say in regards to this is I'm not a fan of the I'm offended just for the sake of being offended. So that's part of the ambivalence in regards to me kind of not being so wholeheartedly for this. Now, I'm not against it. You know, you've seen it happen, obviously, in college sports, whether it's the St. John's, formerly known as the Red Storm, or they're known as the Red Storm now. They were the Redmen before, the Syracuse Orange, after they were called the Orangemen. And and you, and you see it as it goes all through the entire world of college sports. You know, the Stanford Cardinal used to be known as the Stanford Indians. So it seems like college sports were always more on top of it in regards to wanting these things not to be so offensive. Now, listen, years go by, and I'm sure we're going to forget that the Washington football team was known as the Redskins. They're hit their... Um, heritage and history is there. It's always going to say up through the 2019-2020 season in the National Football League that the uh, Washington football team was known as the Redskins. But I would like to see the Cleveland baseball team because every time you hear the Cleveland baseball team, you're going to think as, as the organization that used to be known as the Indians. And know that we've progressed far enough that we don't think that's okay anymore. And the same thing is with the Redskins. We don't think that Redskins as a nickname was tolerable enough for us. So we've moved on and we now look at them as a football team. And all in all, what are athletics? What are sports? They're entertainment. That's what it's out there to be. Fans aren't going to jump ship because they don't have a Native American nickname anymore. I'm sure the Washington football team fans are just as passionate and love their team and are certainly happy that their team's in first place right now. If the Cleveland baseball team goes out there and wins a World Series within the next couple years, you know, there's not going to be a bunch of people out there saying, oh, well, I would have liked them better when they were known as the Indians. This copyright broadcast is authorized under internet rights granted by the World Wide Web and the solely for entertainment of our audience. Any publication or reproduction or the use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this show without the express written consent of the past ball show, JohnPielli.com and JohnPielli LLC is prohibited. Any commercial or the use of the program, such as by charge and admission for its showing, 
is similarly prohibited. So for, for those that are longtime listeners to the show, may notice a little bit of a difference here. We got some new lighting in there. We did a little bit of redecorating. Um, as always, thank everybody that spends even a, even a second or two listening to the Passball Show. And I, I do get all your comments and I try to I try to verse them back in regards to the show to try to address every legitimate point that's brought up for anybody that wants to talk about baseball, sports, and unifying America. So you look at the New York Jets as they just lost their 13th consecutive game to start the season. They're three losses away from being the fourth team or I'm sorry, it will be the fifth team in, uh, in a, the uh, Super Bowl era to finish the season with zero wins. And you had the Buccaneers, obviously, of 1976 when they went zero and 14. I think it was the, the Lions or the Broncos, maybe. I have to look it up. There was a team in the strike-shortened season of 1982 that didn't have any wins. And, of course, we know about the more recent ones of the 0-16 Detroit Lions, and, of course, the 0-16 Browns of just three years ago. Now, the Jets obviously are trying to top that. Topping that for a reason of having a chance to get the number one overall pick and move on from their quarterback, Sam Darnold, and start a new generation with Trevor Lawrence, the quarterback from Clemson. Now, there's a couple different things you could think of. And I was thinking about, you know, quarterbacks that were the contest, you know, the undisputed number one player overall that, you know, had some issues with where they were projected to go. John Elway was getting ready to be taken by the Baltimore Colts. And Elway basically refused to play there. Colts took him number one overall anyway. They worked out a deal with the Denver Broncos and the rest was history. Eli Manning, known in New York lore for winning the two Super Bowls as the quarterback of the New York football Giants, was originally drafted by the former Los Angeles Chargers that were then in San Diego. And Eli Manning didn't want to play there. He made a big deal about it. They worked out a deal with the Giants. Philip Rivers ended up playing in San Diego. You know, obviously know what happened with Eli Manning and the Giants. I wonder, as Trevor Lawrence is sitting here contemplating his future, he, he doesn't have to come out right now. And that's the difference, certainly, between Manning and Elway and Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence still has another year of eligibility left. He could go back to school if he wants. And I think a lot of that would have to do with where, where he is academically. It, is his degree really something that he has a lot of interest in? Is this something that is that feasible that, you know, once he play, you know, he, he goes to school one more year, he could finish his college degree and obviously it'll be something that he can never take away from him. Maybe that's something that he is contemplating now while he considers whether or not he wants to play for the New York Jets. They are a badly run franchise. They've been a badly run franchise for a while. You know, there, there seems to be a lack of continuity when it comes to ownership in the front office and the coach and the coaching staff and the coaching staff down to the players. And if it was just one owner, if it was just one general manager, if it was just one coach, if it was one quarterback, one group of players, you'd say off with that and just move on to somebody else. But there really seems to be some disfiguration within the New York Jets organization. And I think that is something serious that every player, that whether they're coming from college, whether they're a free agent, looking to see where they want to spend the next handful of years of their career, no matter where you're at in the National Football League as you're coming in or if you're already in it, you have to look at the New York Jets and say the lack of continuity is really something that may determine whether you want to go there or not. Now, more than likely, Trevor Lawrence is going to go into the NFL draft and the Jets, assuming they lose their next three games, which, by the way, I'm still betting that the Jets win a game this year. Not to a point where it screws up their number one overall pick, 
because the Jacksonville Jaguars might win another game too. But I believe that the Jets are going to win another game this year. Now, if the Jets go 0-16, I'll go back on this show and I'll say I was wrong. I didn't believe that the Pittsburgh Steelers were going undefeated. I don't believe that the New York Jets are going winless. Some people may say, hey, their opportunity to win a game was that Raiders game where the you know David Carr throws, I'm sorry, Derek Carr throws the Hail Mary and Greg Williams sends the entire kitchen sink at the quarterback and the receiver's wide open for a touchdown. I, I get it. Maybe that could have been a Jets chance to win a game this year. I think they're going to go out there and win one anyway. But, you know, as it applies to having the number one overall pick, you know, it's it's sad to be in that situation when you know you drafted the quarterback of your future just three years ago. And obviously, if you go back in this past year's draft with Joe Burrow and Tua Tagovailoa and Justin Herbert, you're seeing three quarterbacks drafted by three teams that are pretty confident that that quarterback's going to be with them going forward. You go into the draft of the year before, and who you got? You got Kyler Murray. You got Daniel Jones. Dwayne Haskins got in the game yesterday for Washington. He's, by the way, he's got to learn how to kneel down. Uh, does he not know what a victory formation is? You know, as he jogs back with people coming at him, basically causing a scene at the end of the Washington football team 49er game. Dwayne Haskins, probably not part of the football team's future. Daniel Jones, at least going into next year, will be for the Giants. And the same thing you could say about Kyler Murray in Arizona as he gets that team pretty you know, close or on the brink of being in position to make the playoffs. And then you go back the year before that. And there's Baker Mayfield. And there's Sam Darnold. And there's Josh Allen. Josh Rosen, who really as he's sitting in a practice squad for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, maybe on the borderline of losing a spot in the league. And it's hard to say after a couple of years, and you remember him on draft day when he was selected number 10 overall by the Arizona Cardinals, he said nine teams are going to really regret not taking me. Well, to that point, those nine teams and every other team except for the Arizona Cardinals are pretty happy that he didn't take Josh Rosen. Because Josh Rosen proved himself so little, part of it could have been coaching, part of it could have been how bad that team was, part of it could have been the fact that that Arizona Cardinal team was in such bad shape, but it was determined that a quarterback that was taken in the first round of the draft just a year ago was all of a sudden not the future, you know, not part of the future for that franchise. Because they went out there, they got the number one pick, and they took Kyler Murray. And the reason that I brought this up is because Sam Darnold, who was taken in that same draft with Josh Rosen, might be on the borderline of needing to play for a different football team. The Jets may have moved on from Sam Darnold. Part of it could be the potential 0-16 season. Part of it could be the potential that the Jets, just a couple years after drafting Darnold, are unequivocally the worst team in the National Football League. And like I said, even if they win a game, they're still the worst team in the league. I think the Jaguars and the Jets, if they played each other 10 times, I think the Jaguars will beat the Jets 9 out of 10 times. That's how bad the Jets are. So you ask yourself some questions. The Jets probably have a good possibility of being able to do something with Sam Darnold, probably get at least a second round draft pick back for him. And hopefully they get it in this draft where they can work on building their team up. I mean, to have Trevor Lawrence, there's no reason to have Sam Darnold. You know, it's not like Sam Darnold's going to teach anything to Trevor Lawrence. But we've talked about the quality of quarterback as it exists in the National Football League. And we know it's not that good. We know after you get through the top 10 or 12 quarterbacks and maybe you add another half a dozen in there that are fairly good, and starters, you get into the aspect of why, and you'll see turnover, and you'll know that certain quarterbacks' job are only good are, are only as good as they are performing at the moment. And I was trying to figure it out, going through all the divisions, all the teams that could use a quarterback next year, and I think it would make sense. You know, you think of Tom Brady, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, 
Is he going to come back next year? He probably will. And if he does, I don't think you're really looking to put a Sam Darnold behind him. But you think of New Orleans. And Sean Payton, the, the head coach of the New Orleans Saints, talks about Taysom Hill as if he is his quarterback in the future. And he may be. But he knows quarterbacks. He brought in Jameis Winston this past year. He brought in Teddy Bridgewater last year. I don't think it would be a bad fit if Drew Brees does retire to bring yourself a Sam Darnold in there and have him, hey, if he if he picks up this offense, maybe as well as Teddy Bridgewater did last year, then maybe all of a sudden he's in there. Now you think of the Denver Broncos and Drew Locke. Now, Drew Locke played well yesterday. Drew Locke has had some good performances in his time as the Denver Broncos quarterback, but and that team may be winning a couple more games than expected. They're certainly not going 3-13 and 13 this year. That may not be a bad spot as well. You think of Pittsburgh and Ben Roethlisberger. Now, I don't think you get any sign or indication that Ben's looking to walk away after this year. But if he does, I don't think the Pittsburgh Steelers got their quarterback in the future in Mason Rudolph. So I think there's a number of different op uh, you know, opportunities for the Jets and for other teams in the National Football League to take a chance on Sam Darnold. And how about the Chicago Bears? I mean, I know Bears fans are loving Mitch Trubisky because he, he led them to a nice victory yesterday against, by the way, a bad Houston, um, sorry, Oilers. I, I love the Oilers. That's why I bring it up. A Houston Texans football team. But, you know, are the Bears going to hold on to and think long term when they're thinking about Mitch Trubisky being their quarterback? They brought Nick Foles in here for a reason. They benched Mitch Trubisky after a couple of games this year for a reason because they were looking probably to light, you know, light something you know under his behind and get him going and to give him a challenge. And they're questioning whether they believe that Mitch Trubisky, a quarterback that they traded up in a draft to get number two four years ago, is the one to be the quarterback of the future of this team. So I think there's plenty of options if you're the Jets. And certainly having the number one overall pick and getting Trevor Lawrence, and even if you slip somehow and get the number two pick and get Justin Fields, you're probably not in that bad of a shape either. And, you know, one one aspect, and I, and I, and I was talking about this with some Philadelphia Eagle fans the other day. Now, yesterday you think of the Eagles and Jalen Hurts playing and Jalen Hurts leading the Eagles to a win over the New Orleans Saints. And, you know, the Eagles at 4-8-1 and one still have a chance to make the playoffs by possibly winning the NFC East Division. Yeah, that's all good. You know, Jalen Hurts isn't Donovan McNabb. He's certainly not Ron Jaworski. He's a, a quarterback that got a chance to play and played a good game. Now, is there uncertainty about the future at the quarterback position for the Philadelphia Eagles, absolutely. And you know about Carson Wentz and his contract and a cap hit if he's not a, if he's released before the start of next season, if he's released before the start of the season after. The Eagles have committed themselves a lot of money and dead cap space if they decide to get themselves out of the contract of Carson Wentz. Now, Eagle fans think, ah, well, just go go trade him for a couple number one draft picks. Now, if Carson Wentz was every bit as good as he was that year that the Eagles won the Super Bowl, and obviously we know he was an MVP candidate, he was performing at a high level, all of a sudden he gets hurt right before the playoffs and Nick Foles takes over and the Eagles win the Super Bowl, yada, yada, yada. The story's been told a million times, but you, know, you think of Carson Wentz at being at that level again. Is that ever going to happen? And if you're an Eagle fan, the prayers, the hopes, the aspirations were, and probably still are, that there's some of that left in him. Unfortunately, this year has been a horrible season for him. You know, if you think of the year 2020 as it applies to the National Football League and quarterbacks, 2020 is so bad, you think of 2020 and you think of Carson Wentz. He's been that bad. Now, the Eagles, ideally, because they were paying this guy down the road to be a top quarterback, they'd like for him to get that back. But if he's not, you got to understand that a lot of other teams are, are going to say, well, what the hell would I want this guy here for anyway? Why would I want him if you don't want him? 
You're paying him all this money. You know, you, you're not starting him. There's got to be a reason to that. Why am I going to go out there and fork over, you know, two number one draft picks or even one for that matter for a guy that's not even good enough to be on the field right now? And that's why I think that if the Eagles have any interest in moving Carson Wentz, it would have to be in a creative manner and fashion. And I could see a scenario of a Carson Wentz trade to the New York Jets. And hear me out for a second. There's no team that has any more cap space than the New York Jets. Now, obviously, if they acquired Carson Wentz's contract, they would acquire it with the same issues that the Philadelphia Eagles have. They can't release Carson Wentz or else they'll get a dead cap hit of $50 million for next year, $20 million for the next year. But maybe if the Jets make a trade for Carson Wentz and roster him this year and then maybe cut him next year with the dead cap hit, it's more manageable. And I say, what's in this for the Jets? Are the Jets getting Carson Wentz and their quarterback for the future? The answer is probably no. But if I'm the Eagles and I'm looking to create this cap space and maybe make up for a bad mistake in what would have been the signing to Carson Wentz of a long-term deal, I'd consider a trade. And I'd consider a couple first-rounders, a couple second-rounders, a bevy of picks that are going to go to the New York Jets. Now, the Eagles are going to have to pay either in money when it comes to dead cap space or in draft picks to get him off their team. Now, how do I swing this pendulum back in a direction where it could be favorable for the Philadelphia Eagles? Because just getting Carson Wentz off your roster is not worth all those draft picks. So I suggest Sam Darnold back going to Philadelphia and at least he gets to compete with Jalen Hurts and maybe Darnold in a different type of environment with a better offensive head coach in Doug Peterson, which the, like him or not, if you're an Eagles fan, he won a Super Bowl. And I think I could get even uh, the most snarky and uh, miserable Eagles fan to admit that they'd rather have Doug Peterson as their head coach than Adam Gase. But you think about it, if the Eagles get Darnold in a trade for Wentz, having enough draft picks that could offset the salary cap hit that Carson Wentz being on the Jets would be, it may actually be the best possible place for him. So I was thinking about the, the head coaches as we get a couple weeks away, three weeks away from a an important day in the National Football League, and they call it Black Monday. And that's when NFL teams decide to announce the Monday after the last regular season game that you know their said coach will not be back next year. You pretty much know there's going to be a couple guys that are going to be out right off the bat. One of them is going to be Gase with the Jets. Another is going to be Doug Marone with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Another one likely will be Anthony Lynn with the Los Angeles Chargers. And that's an unfortunate situation there because the Chargers end up drafting Justin Herbert, and he's been pretty good. But all of a sudden, that team has fallen apart after playing some competitive games earlier in the season. And all of a sudden, you kind of feel that maybe it is a head coach issue there. Maybe they need a change um, in, in scenery from the top. You'll see how it ends up turning out. But those are probably the three teams that I would be shocked if they didn't move on from their head coaches. You think about some other situations, obviously Dallas with Mike McCarthy, more than likely they'll they'll stick around and they'll they'll agree to another year. You got the Eagles and Doug Peterson, but I, I think there's been enough that blames could blame the digression uh, on of Carson Wentz on Carson Wentz, which may not be fair if you think about it. I mean, is Doug Peterson using them right? All of a sudden, Doug Peterson, you know, has this ridiculous game plan of all these different plays for Jalen Hurts. Where was it while Carson Wentz was in there? But you, you could see, hey, maybe the Eagles and their front office and their ownership uh, decided to make a move. 
I'd be surprised if Doug Peterson was let go. You know, you look at some other scenarios in different cities, Atlanta, are they going to get a new head coach? Are they going to hold on to Raheem Morris? All of a sudden, the Falcons are going out there winning some games. You know, they're, they're being competitive. They're playing good football. You know, they may not be on their way, but they certainly look a lot better than they did when, you know, uh, what's his name? Dan Quinn was the head coach. You know, you think about you know, other teams. A lot of other teams seem to be secure when it comes to their head coaches, at least for another year. You know, Vic Fangio, I don't think he's going anywhere from Denver. He's got that team playing a little bit better than what was expected. You know, you look at some of the other possibilities. I mean, Cleveland's got their head coach in the future. Baltimore, you know, unless John Harbaugh wants to leave, is not going anywhere there. You know, Zach Taylor is probably going to be expected to have another year with Joe Burrow to work with him in Cincinnati. So where's where's your bevy of coaches that are going to end up losing their jobs? Like I said, unless there's a, a surprise in Philadelphia or in Dallas, I think you're really only looking at Gase and you're only looking at Marone and you're only looking at probably Anthony Lynn in Los Angeles with the Chargers. As always, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to the Pass Ball Show. A little bit of a recap today, and I wanted to throw this in there. In 1932, there was a strike-shortened season in the National Football League. The Baltimore Colts, in a nine-game season, went 0-8-1. and one. And the reason I bring that up is I was speaking earlier about teams that finished a season without a victory. And the New York football Jets are obviously close to doing that three games away. I remain with my prediction that the Jets will win a game this year. And not because I'm rooting for it, but I just, I didn't feel that the Pittsburgh Steelers were going to go undefeated. I just don't feel that the Jets could go an entire season playing competitively because I don't think the players on the field are tanking. Contrary to what people said about Greg Williams and his call on that last play at a game against the Raiders a couple weeks ago, I don't think there's anybody on that sideline or on that football field that's trying to lose. And if that's the case, I think you're going to have a competitive enough effort to catch somebody off guard, to catch an opponent that may not prepare completely for the Jets, that may take them a little bit lightly. And when that happens, I think the Jets are going to be in the win column this year. I don't think they're going to be the I don't think they're going to be the 5th team in the history of the National Football League to have a winless season. I just don't think it's going to happen. Now if you go back in into, into some uh some other teams, you know, there's the uh you got the Cowboys of 1960 were 0-11 and 1. The Brooklyn Tigers of 1944 were 0 and 10. The Card Pit team of 1944 were 0 and 10. And the reason that they were called the Card Pit team was there, there was a merger between the Chicago Cardinals and the Pittsburgh Steelers due to a shortage in regards to players because of World War II. And actually, I find this pretty fascinating. You know, there was, there was, it, it was just, a, a, an unfortunate situation where you had so many of your top men and women leaving all sorts of workforces to go de defend their country in war. And football, particularly, particularly professional football, took a major hit. In fact, the Steelers, which I didn't know, themselves had merged with the Philadelphia Eagles the previous year because of the same reasons. And imagine having a combination of three football teams, basically any players that you, you could find off of those three squads, but the three organizations, right? Their general managers, their, their scouting staff, the all the influences that are in there between three organizations to go winless in a football season. You know about the Detroit Lions of 1942, the Cincinnati Reds of 1934, the Columbus Tigers of 1925, and the Columbus Panhandles in 1922. So you're looking at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 
11 times in the history of the National Football League, a team has gone winless. Are the Jets going to be number 12? I'm going to go with no. I think they win a game before the season's over. We spent a little time talking about the potential name change in regards to the Cleveland baseball team, which is what I'll refer to them until there's a decision on whether they're going to stick with that, which, by the way, I'm totally cool with. I have no issue with the Cleveland baseball team being their nickname because I think it calls out the fact that there kind of was some injustice that existed before. The, the fact that the name has you know racial implications where people are hurt and people are slurred when that name is called out. And I think we can move to the point where we, 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 we realize that we've finally gotten over it. We finally changed it. I mean, if you go out there and you change the Cleveland name to whatever you want it to be, it's like we're trying to sweep it under the rug as if it never happened. The Washington football team, every time I think of that, I think of the years where they were using a, a Native American racial slur as their nickname. And this year is the first year they decided that they weren't going to do that anymore. And you know what? Every time I hear Cleveland baseball team, I'm going to think the same thing. You wonder if the Atlanta Braves are probably on their way to do doing something similar. Probably. And once again, you know, most people think of these Native American names and they're not bothered by it because it doesn't impact impact them directly. It's not something that's against them. They, in most cases, probably don't have friends that came up through, you know, and had ancestors through Native American tribes. But the reality is, is that it, if it's hurtful, why waste the time and keep it out there? Talked about Trevor Lawrence, Sam Darnold. What about a Sam Darnold deal for Carson Wentz with the Eagles? The Jets, most cap space in the National Football League. Maybe if they bring in a head coach, you know, maybe somebody more offensively inclined than Adam Gase, somebody that could get Trevor Lawrence going, maybe fires up Carson Wentz and gets something out of him too. You don't want Sam Darnold sitting on the bench behind Trevor Lawrence after only being in the league for a couple years. Sam Darnold was drafted number three overall for a reason by the Jets because he was going to be their franchise quarterback. And yes, he's disappointed. He hasn't been that great. He hasn't taken his franchise to the next level. As you look at him right now, they're 0-13. and 13. But I think he's he deserves at least the opportunity to compete for a job, something he's not going to get if the Jets have the number one overall pick. And if they do, they're drafting Trevor Lawrence unless he decides he wants to go back to school. And the one advantage that he has over John Elway who didn't want to play for the Baltimore Colts, and Eli Manning, who didn't want to play for the San Diego Chargers, are the fact that Trevor Lawrence does have one more year of eligibility. He could go back to school. He could go back to school and not play football and be ready for the draft for next year. He could go back to Clemson and opt out. What he'll do is he'll, learn, he'll lose a year where he could be playing in the National Football League, but that's his prerogative. I don't think the Jets situation is that bad where somebody like that would decide they wouldn't want to play for him. But if that's the case, it would be something that we haven't seen before. Will Trevor Lawrence be okay? And let's let's be serious. If you're a player that has that much talent, you know that you're going to the team that finished with the worst record in the league the year before. So no matter what, unless you're Andrew Luck in a weird situation where... Peyton Manning got hurt, has neck and back surgery, misses the whole season, and a perennial playoff team and Super Bowl champion team at one point all of a sudden becomes 0-14 and 2-14 and for the season. That doesn't happen too often. More than likely, you're going to a team that sucks. Trevor Lawrence, as he gets ready to possibly and probably whenever he's ready to be the number one overall pick in a National Football League draft, he knows he's going to a team that sucks. Does it matter if that team's Jacksonville or the Jets? I don't think it should. Because I think in both situations, you're going to get a new overhaul. You're going to get, possibly, 
if you're run correctly, some of the better head coaching candidates in to do interviews with. So I do want to thank everybody for tuning in to the Passball Show. Brought to you by JohnPielli.com, by St. Alwish's Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey, by Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck, located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. You can check the show out, if you haven't yet, on uh, Apple Music, on Spotify, on Amazon Music, and, of course, YouTube. God bless you, and as always, I'll see you on the other side.